can dreams come true? There's a study in Philippians, and we're now at chapter 4. And have you been here for, uh, for any of these messages? Have you heard any of these messages during this series? You know that our passion this year is to help people, to help you find and walk into your individual callings from God. Our vision that we have kept before you each week that we put up on the screen that says our vision is to help people connect to God. Our purpose every Sunday and throughout the week in our small group settings, whether it be here from our church or in the community, is to help others know God. It's to help connect people to people because people, we need each other. We can't do it alone. We, 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 even as a body here, we can't do it alone. You know, we've been able to reach into China. We've been reaching to the South Pacific. We've been able to reach into Romania and, and to, to Eastern Europe, over into Wales and into Latin America and, and Mexico and here in the States with our, uh, on the Indian reservations. And, and, uh, in different, uh, but we could, if they depended just on us, it wouldn't happen. But because of you and others like you, outside these four walls and with other churches, we've been able to literally meet thousands upon thousands with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so don't think, you, you know, that you, 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 well, what I do may be a small part of that. Listen, that's what the body is. And we need each other. You have guiltiness in the body that others may not have. And God has you here for that purpose. And God has you in the body for a purpose, for fellowship and encouraging one another and fulfilling your own callings, using them outside these four walls, helping people that we may never meet. And then we say that we want to connect people to outreach. Let me tell you what we're saying. Connect people to God, we're saying we love God. Connecting people to people, we're saying love people. And connecting people to outreach, that's to love the lost, to love the world. And we want to go into our neighborhoods, our communities, our marketplace, our workplace, even to the nations and shout Jesus. That's one of the things we want to do this year as we, John, with Helping Hands Ministry, who our very own Pearlene is minister over. You know, our outreach to go beyond what we are here to help others, to help other churches, to help other people. And she's doing that. And she's got me involved in doing it. <laughs> Again, what we're saying is we want to love God, love people, and love the world. Now, you've heard me say in every one of these messages so far, God made you on purpose, for a purpose. We hear people talking about that. God, God made you on a purpose. Yeah, yeah, he made you on a purpose, but for a purpose. And this is what this series has been about. Now, last week, we saw that God's purpose, or that his preferential will, and, and, and that's his desire for us. His preferential will is that all mankind be saved, but not all mankind is saved. His preferential will is, is that all be discipled and grow in Christ and use that gift and talents, but not all does so. But that is his will for us. His preferential will is that no one go to hell. But yet there are those because, see, that preferential will is up to our choosing, our choices, our surrendering. And so we saw that God's purpose in Philippi and his preferential will and, and Paul's desire for the church of Philippi and for the Philippian church was that they become like Jesus. Remember we talk about that, that he strived to reach the prize for getting those things which are behind and that he strived to reach that. And, and that prize, when we come to recognize it, that prize is you and I becoming like him. That's his dream for us. That's his, his desire for us. That's his will for us, that we become like Christ, his son. And we saw that last week. The prize, he said in the very first chapter, that he would complete in us if we would choose to do so. He said that he would complete the work in us, in each one of us, on that day. That means it will not be complete until that day. You have not been perfected yet. You have not reached that place in God yet that God wants you to be. In fact, you will not reach it until that day. And that day is the day of the Lord. That day is when he returns in the rapture to, to receive his church. And it will be on that day that he will complete everything in us. You say, well, they've been talking about that for a long time and he hasn't come yet. Be careful because that day could be your day today. 
See, today could be that day for you to meet Christ, to stand before the Lord. Many of you know, we can look back right now, and, and over the past 10 years, we can name the numbers of people, even in our own congregation, not just outside of our congregation, just in our own congregation that has already gone to meet the Lord. I mentioned uh, Mr. Ganey a number of times, how that, he, that morning he talked about heaven and talked about Christ. We're in home that afternoon, it's Timothy's grandfather. We're in home that afternoon, took a nap, Woke up, got ready to go to the prison, do his prison ministry, and lay back on the bed with a heart attack and went immediately to see Christ. Talk about heaven all day. Talk about the Lord all that morning after church. And I guess the Lord said, well, you're so excited about heaven, I'm going to invite you to come on over now. Amen. Now, you're saved for a purpose. You're saved on purpose for a purpose. And you've heard me say this too. It's not just... A fire escape. Your salvation, my friend, is not just a fire escape. It's not just to save you from hell. Now, don't get me wrong. If you've been here for any length of time, you know that I believe the Scripture teaches that there is a place called hell, Hades. And it's a real place. But that's not God's will for you. In fact, in Matthew 25, 41, God te Jesus told us why hell was created in the very beginning. He said, it said, then he also said to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared, not for you, but for the devil and his angels. That judgment was placed on Satan, we believe, shortly after creation when he rebelled against Father in heaven. But because of unbelief, because of Adam's sin, all men now are under that condemnation, for all have sinned, Romans 3.23 says, and come short of the glory of God. We are all already under judgment. It was Christ's purpose to come and to take us out from under that judgment, according to John 3.16, 17, and 18. But it was never God's desire. If anyone goes to hell, they have to know that it was against God's purpose for that life, because that is not what he tended. In fact, Jesus, God the Son, we like to say the Son of God, but let me tell you, He's God. Jesus is God the Son. And He came for the very purpose, His desire was to come and to save the lost. Hello? That was His purpose, coming for lost people. He, he, listen, if He came just to teach us good morals, then we would think His life would be all about ethics and about keeping the Ten Commandments. If he came just to fix the environment, then his life would have been about trees and plants and the oceans and lakes and rivers. If he came to teach us how to model manners and, and, and nice living, then we'll have to place our Bibles beside the December issue of Martha Stewart Living. But Jesus said in Luke 19.10, he said the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. He came to seek and save the lost. We're lost people. We were lost. We, we say that we, we are sinners saved by grace. We, we, we say that we once was lost, but now we're saved. We, we, we were separated from God. And Jesus said in John 12, verse 44, Jesus cried and said, Whosoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. Now he's talking about the Father. And whoever sees me has seen the Father. He said, I've come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. And he said, if anyone hears my words and does not keep them, he said, I do not judge him. What? He said, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. But the one who rejects me. Oh, can we stop and pray for those who rejected Christ? Can we stop and pray for those in our family, even those who don't even realize that they have rejected him? Because it says here that those who have rejected him, he said, does not receive my words as a judge, but he said, the one who rejects me and who does not receive my words, the word that I have spoken will judge him on that last day. You know that's going to be a last day. And now we're talking about the very last day of all time. Now we're over in Revelation, the 20th chapter, which we preached so much about last year. Revelation, the 20th chapter, when the last day of the earth, when the last day of time ceases, 
It will be the last day when the great white throne judgment takes place. And everyone from Adam's day to that day who rejected Christ will stand before the God that they are already under judgment. They'll stand before the Father who sent his very son so they would not have to be there. He says, what is it, Ezekiel 33, 11, 11, 33, where it, it said that Christ, that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, that he wished all men would be saved. He said the same thing over in 1 Timothy. What is it, 1, 5? He says the same thing in 1 Peter, or 2 Peter 3, 9. He, it's his desire that mankind be saved. So, Father, we reach our hands up to you this day. And we pray for all, Lord, who have not yet received your grace. We pray for those, Lord, who have rejected you and rejected your son and rejected the gospel. That, Lord, your Holy Spirit may draw them to you and that they may not reject you, that they may spend an eternity with you. Because that's your purpose. That's your purpose, Father. That they have eternal life. And that's what he says. He said, I know that his commandment is not eternal damnation, he says in the 50th verse. He said, but it's eternal life. And he said, whatever I say, therefore I say the Father has told me. He saved you on purpose, but for a purpose. And God does not intend to merely save us from our sinful condition and from God's eternal condemnation. He saved us to restore us to what he intended from us from the very beginning with Adam and Eve. We have an eternal inheritance. Your soul and spirit has an endless existence. And he intends, listen, God said he intends to fulfill his eternal purpose he said in Isaiah 14 24 what I plan will be he said what I plan will come to pass it will be completed and over in Revelation 20 he said it is complete but as such God's salvation does not merely deal with our problems of sin he restores us to his original plan for man it's that God's purpose before man ever sinned you know after the failed assassination attempt against President Ronald Reagan, he is said to have said this, I have a sense that I was spared for a purpose and that all my time belonged to God after that. We all shall have the same sense of purpose that once we came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, what he has saved us from, we all have different depths of sin. We all have different testimonies. Some can talk about being delivered from drugs and alcohol. Some can be talking about delivered from crime. And others can talk about uh, bad habits and, and things. And then there are good moral people who can talk about, testify, that even though they were good morally, they were still lost in Christ. Save them and deliver them. And after that, our purpose should be to serve him because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. We were spared for a reason, to make a difference, not just with our lives, but in the lives of those around us. Jesus just didn't die on the cross so we could go on living any way we like. He made us for a purpose. He redeemed us for a purpose. And he wants to fulfill that purpose in your life. This is what Peter says. Peter said in 1 Peter 4.10, Each of you shall use whatever gift you have received, whatever that gift may be. To serve others. You should be using your gift and your passion. The things that you love. That you, the things that you enjoy. That should be your passion to use it to serve people in behalf of God. He said, as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. You have been given gifts and, and abilities and, and relationships with other people and, and with one another for a reason. And that's to help other people to know about Christ and to tell, for them to tell others about Christ. You this morning have a calling from God. You are here on planet Earth for a reason. Remember, our very first message was on Jeremiah 29, 11. See, God has given you specific gifts and particular specific strengths that others don't have. You may be a math whiz. You, you might be a wise counselor with... with uh, with the gift of wisdom. Uh, maybe you have a mind for electronics or, or a mind for business. Maybe you're great at organizing people and getting things done. Maybe it's, you, you're great at music and entertainment. Perhaps it's cooking. 
There's a gentleman in town that's a real good friend of ours. And he attends our men's breakfast from time to time. And he, that, that's his calling to cook. He cooks and helps raise money in his church. And he cooks for other churches when they have need to help them raise money. And twice a year, he has a, he has a fundraiser himself where he cooks a good bronzer stew. And it's good. Where he used to raise money for the teenagers in his church so they can go to different camps and so forth. That's his gift and his calling. And so he uses it to help raise money and to, to, to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I think about Herman and Ruth Mosley. Some of you may know them from over in Roanoke Rapids. They have an organization that's called, are you ready? Dirt. That's it, dirt. It means disaster immediately response team. And they use that and raise money to help people when uh, they've... Uh, I cannot tell you how many people they've helped. They've helped raise money when people have lost everything they had in fire. They have raised raise money when people have lost stuff during a tornado or during an adverse uh, uh, weather. They, they, they've used that to help raise money when people could not pay medical bills and they were facing financial ruin because, you know, they, they didn't have the money to even go to the doctor. They, they, every year... You'll find in the paper time and time again where dirt gets involved in helping people. And they do it in the name of Christ. They do it to further the gospel. They do it to shout Jesus. They do it because I was hungry and no one fed me. I was naked and no one closed me. I was in prison and no one visited me. I, I was sick and in the hospital and no one prayed for me. That's that ministry. They, they took and put it together, and now others have come in to just Listen, you have a purpose. It might be working with your hands, maybe with carpentry or painting. I think of all that, that Chris and John Taylor and, and uh, uh, different ones in the church, others that are, David and all that, 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 that just different ones that, that use our talents and gifts and stuff, uh, with their hands to keep our church going and, you know, repair and so forth. That, that, that is, listen, you know, we, we operate on a small budget and a lot of times we don't have money for, for when, when something bad may happen at, at one time and they're there. Amen. God, listen, God's purpose for you probably involves the things that you're already good at. Hello? I know trying to discover your life purpose can be stressful. It can be overwhelming. It can seem sometimes as big and confusing and frustrating. You want to go forward, but you don't know how. You want to find God's purpose, but you feel like you, you are wandering aimlessly. But can I tell you, you can trust God to lead you where He wants you to go. He'll lead you, Psalms 23, 2 and 3. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. The steps of a righteous man, the scripture teaches, is ordered by the Lord. See, you might feel confused, but God doesn't. He knows why to get you to, to where your dream is, where your, your, your aspiration is, your, your desire is. He knows how to get you there if you begin to rest in Him and trust Him. So let me ask you, what is the one thing that you're particularly passionate about? I mean, that can be anything. It can be business. I started to say it could be drama, but we have enough of that around. So I'm going to say arts. It, it could be the arts. It could be economics. It could be alleviating poverty. It could be music. It could be helping children. It could be coaching kids, soccer and ball or whatever. It could be helping the elderly in the nursing home or, or becoming a nurse to help people and to minister to them health. Let, think about it, whatever it could be. It, it, listen, if, you, if money was not an issue, what would you love to to do. See, determining your passions often helps you figure out what God has called you to do. And we've said that this year, this is Emmanuel Worship Center's purpose and dream to help you find out that calling. To help you find out that purpose. That desire in your heart. Amen? This year, that's what we desire, to help you develop it and to create circles of opportunities where you can use that gift and that calling. Amen?
See, God begins with a dream, and that's what we talk about. Can dreams come true? And we talk about it's not a dream that you have at night, but it, it's that that which has been dropping your spirit, your, your aspiration, in, in, in what you feel God desires for your purpose in life. And many times it simply comes first as a seed, just an idea. But then it begins to grow inside of you. It, it begins to become a, a passion. And it may or may not be obviously at first to be spiritual. But make no mistake, everything in your life is in some way related to the spiritual. We talk about how God will build on that dream and he'll, he'll refine that dream and, 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 and how that when we commit it to him and commit ourselves over to him, and then he will begin to make something out of that dream for himself. Remember, he's the potter or the clay. So we've been looking at dreams in the study in the book of Philippians. And so far we've looked at three key elements in the first three chapters. We've talked about first concerning this dream. We need to have the right environment. We need to create the right environment for these aspirations and dreams and callings to come to pass. Last we, we spoke in, in chapter 2 about the right attitude. Last week we talked about having the right goals. And this morning we want to talk about having the right energy. As you can see with these concepts, your purpose, callings, and your individual race, your, your walking, your dreams, can all be connected. It's connected. In fact, thinking about running, uh, uh, I read the story the other day where this man was on his way across the country. He was his, his girlfriend. And, and so he, he, he'd been driving all night. He'd driven about 15 hours, and he was worn out, and he was tired, and he realized he needed to stop. And so he figured he was, the next town he came to, he would just pull over and, you know, find a nice park and, and get a couple of hours of shut-eyes. And so he, sure enough, he found a real nice park, pulled over there about, around about 8 o'clock, and he laid his head back and just about dozed off when there was a knock on his window. And he looked up, and there was a jogger that's out jogging. He said, do you know the time? And the guy looked at his watch, says, 8.15. He said, thank you, and he took off running. Well, he laid his head back and started to doze off again, and there was another knock at his window. He looked up, it was another jogger. He said, do you know the time? He said, well, it's 8.30. And then he looked around and saw that he was parked next to a jogging track, that people was out there running, and he saw several other joggers coming his way. So he wrote on a piece of paper, I do not know the time, and put it upon the window. They're about to drop off to sleep when there was a knock on the window. And the guy says, 9 o'clock. A dream is, by definition, it's something that's beyond our reach. It's something that's out there. Something that is beyond where we are today. That's how you know it's a dream. And you might ask, how am I going to get there? How, how can this dream become a reality, a true? I remember... But when a, a friend of ours, one of the elders in that church, came to me, he said, I, I feel the calling to pastor. Well, what do I need to do? How, how do I get started? I said, you wait on the Lord. What? I said, first, you rest in God. You begin to wait on Him. But let me tell you, when it begins to happen, it's going to come so fast, it's going to be like a tornado, like a whirlwind. About a couple of years later, boy, did it happen. And he called me, he said, when you talk about it being like a tornado, a whirlwind, he said, that's exactly what happened. And today he's pastoring a successful church. Because he started first by waiting on the Lord to begin to rest in God. That's one of the first things we have to learn to do. We have to learn that God will almost likely and almost every time we adjust our dreams and our aspirations along the way. And that's why it's so important that we first give God access to our dreams. As we talk about earlier in our messages about giving those aspirations and those callings to God and resting in Him. And then you have to realize that you'll not be able to bring that dream to pass on your own. You won't be able to do it in your own strength. You'll need God's help. More importantly, you'll need God's strength. You'll need His energy. And so how can I reach that thing which seems so far away or seems so impossible that seems bigger than I? Well, if it's bigger than I, then you know it's from God. 
If you don't have the power or the strength to accomplish it, you know it's from God. And, and that is no question that it is outside our ability. And so it, it's outside of our own strength, our own energy, our own power. And everything takes energy, but not just any kind of energy. It has to be the right energy. You know, they teach that these endurance athlete, athletes, you know who I'm talking about, the ones that were these big marathons. And one of the things that we find that these athletes will spend hundreds of dollars on products that provides, you know it, energy. Amen? But not only that, they want products and they, and they want to train their bodies. Now listen to this. I wish I could train my body to do this, to burn fat. That's what they train themselves to do. For their bodies to burn fat when they run in these marathons. Endurance athletes train their bodies to burn fat because it's the right fuel that enables them to go great distances. Especially when they run in these marathons that takes hours. And in addition, to, in addition on these long races, they, they usually have a nutritional plan that, they, that they actually is more important to them than their own, own athletic ability. Because they've got to have energy. And they've got to have the right energy to get where they're going. And not just in these endurance sports, but in the race of life, we've got to have the right energy. Because life is the ultimate endurance race. One of the things I do want to do also is to reduce those things that can weigh them down, that can create drag, that can waste their energy. And we need to do the same thing. So now let's go to the fourth chapter of Philippians. Look at verse 1 through 3. Paul says, Therefore, my dearly loved and long for brothers and sisters, my joy and crown, in this manner, stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. He said, I plead with Yodia and I urge Cynthia to agree in the Lord. Disagreement, strife, Hello, can rob you of your energy. He said, I ask you, loyal, true partners. Remember, we talked in the second chapter that we had to be partners with each other in Christ. He said, yes, and I ask you, loyal, true partners, to help. That word help in the Greek means to assist in holding things together. Hello? It means to assist and serve others. He said, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side. Can I pause here and thank you, women, for your contribution to the kingdom? Can I thank you for your contribution to the gospel? Paul said to help these women who have contend for the gospel at my very side, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. And then he says, He said, fourth verse, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Your greatest strength will not come from you being happy. Your greatest strength will not come from you being happy. Can I tell you something? You're not always going to be happy. That, that dog that you, bite, that you bought and that you were training, when he bites you, you're not happy with him. Amen? When, when, when things go wrong, you're not always happy. But there's something that gives you strength at all times. And that is the joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah 18, 8 and 10. The joy of the Lord is your strength. He said over James 1, 2, 3, 4. James said, my brother counted all joy... When you fall into various trials, what's the joy of that? Hello? He said, the joy is knowing that the test of your faith. Here's the joy. Knowing that the very test of your faith produces patience. And patience has its perfect work. You want to be perfected? Wait on the Lord. That you may be perfect and complete. Listen to this. Lacking nothing. See, joy does not mean the same thing as being happy. Happy is temporary. 
How happy is completely dependent upon your present circumstances. And circumstances can change quickly. Hello? You, you could be in, in, having the greatest day of your life. You can be happy and everything's going wrong and suddenly the phone rings. And someone in your family has passed away. Something terrible has happened to one of your children. And all of a sudden that happiness flees. And you, you, you feel drained of all energy when you receive such news as that. You, you don't even know, who, you, who do I turn to? What do I do? But when you rest in Christ, and he keeps that joy flowing inside of you. So you can have joy when you're not happy. But listen, here's what that word joy means here. Are you ready? Any coffee lovers here? Any coffee lovers who love coffee? The Greek word here means calm delight. When I heard that, I said, that sounds like a good creamer for coffee. A calm delight. And it's derived from our awareness that God is at work regardless of your circumstances. That's, that's where that joy comes from. That God is at work regardless of the circumstances that you find yourself in at that time. You can have that calm delight in knowing that he'll use everything, even sometimes suffering, to bring about his desire in, his dream in our lives. Think about Joseph. What he did for Joseph. Call the dreamer. Think about Israel. When Israel in Babylon, that he raised up a heathen king now named Cyrus. He used evil people when he needs to to bring about his will in fulfilling our purposes. Amen? So let's hurry up. Let's look down into verse, verses 5 and 6 and 7. Where it talks about how we can enter into the rest of the Lord. Remember in verse 4, he said, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Why was Paul when he wrote this? He was in prison. And not the kind of prison we have today. It's more like a, a hole in the ground that, that's wet and damp and, and you have very little light where he was thrown into Later, of course, he, he was removed and, uh, and put under house arrest. But the fact of it is, what could he rejoice about? You know one of the things that he was rejoicing about while he was in prison? He was rejoicing, rejoicing over the church of Philippi, as you'll see in a minute, that had became partners with him. He was rejoicing, as you'll read at the very end of this chapter, I believe, that there was people in Caesar's household who were being saved. Here is Caesar proclaim, compl uh, proclaiming to be a god, and here were those who guarded him and who in his own household, even some of the women in his own household, who were becoming disciples of Christ because of what Paul was enduring, because of what Paul was going through. You never know, my friend, when you're enduring some things that seems beyond your comprehension, when you are suffering the most, when you're crying out to God, God delivered me, God delivered me, that God is using you in that very storm to touch the lives of those around you how you would react. Let's see what kind of God he has now. Let's see what kind of relationship he has really with the Lord. Can he really stand on this table? Will he really love God when everything's falling apart? Can he really proclaim this Jesus that loves him when his wife, his spouse, his children is dying with cancer? What kind of relationship does he really have? Hello? So he said, rejoice in the Lord always. And I would say it again, rejoice. And then he says, let your gentleness be evident, see, to all who is near. Hello? They're watching. Listen, he's near. Jeremiah 23, 23. I don't care where you are in life as a believer this morning. Can I tell you what Jeremiah 23, 23 says? Am I not a God at hand, says the Lord, and not a God that's far off? Am I not a God at hand, says the Lord, and not a God that's far off? He says, then do not be anxious. That, that word, anxious, talks about anxiety and hopelessness. And in other words, he says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition or intercession, but do it with thanksgiving. Present your request to God. 
And then he says this. When you present them to God, when you're resting in the Lord, when you have that calm delight that God is in control. See, that's why the rest is. That's why the joy is. It is a knowing. Knowing. It's like Kate. Kate knew that she could hear that wind blowing. She said, Dad, she, she said, Papa, it, it, it sounds so, so horrible. It, it sounds so loud. She said, and the rain was so hard. But you see, she had a calm delight in her spirit because she had trust her God. And he said, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding. Listen, with God, your hearts and your minds. How many of you realize your mind needs God sometimes? How many of re- you realize it's your mind that will attack you many times? It's your mind that creates fear. It's your mind that creates you, and, and you begin to meditate on, on, and Satan begin to fill you with all this, this nonsense, and this is going to happen, and that's going to happen, and you begin to worry, and, and, all. And, and the fact of it is, if you could have that calm delight, and just rest in God. But now listen to this. It, it says that let the peace of Christ rule. That word rule here in the Greek is our concept of an umpire. Like in baseball. What he called balls and strikes. Calls what's in and what's out. He calls what is good and what's not. See, if you rest, you can flow with God knowing that he's going to call the right one. See, if you don't have no rest, you have no flow. You, you are rest when you're trusting God. You get out of rest when you slip away from trusting God. See, you can work hard and be in rest. Or you can do nothing and be out of rest. Let me give you my example of that. Sitting in the dentist's office. Hello? How many of you have good thoughts when you've got... Never mind, I won't go there. You want his presence? Then go where he is. That's at a place called rest. God dwells in this place called rest. Look at verse 8. He said, finally, brothers, this is what you need to think about. This is, how you need, this is where your rest comes from. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or if a praise worthy, think about such things. With your thoughts, you can create an inner atmosphere where things feel as if that thing has already happened. That will either rob you of your peace and rest and create worry or anxiety, or it will create faith just like it did in Kate's heart that it will be all right. You will act out what you think. So your road to your future to completing that dream is mapped out between your ears before you even take the first step. Paul speaks about trust. And, and, and here he talks about people putting that trust in what? What do most people put that trust in? Money. And so he, verses 9 through 20, he talks about the appreciation of that support and the test of that partnership was the trust that they had in him. And so he says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, Put it into practice. And he says, the God of peace, wait a minute. Yeah, the God of peace will be with you. Wow. He said, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have been renewed for your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you have not had opportunity to show it. Mm, over in Corinthians, there were people who wanted to give, but they had not to give. And so Paul told him uh, that he knew what they wanted to give him to the king. So he said, well, ask the sower for the seed. You know, several years back, I told you the story how that we was, they were raising money at our church in, in Ronald Crappis to, to uh, get out of the uh, small building they was on the street and to have their own permanent building. And, and Jen and I praying at that time, we were going through some situations and all and, and just like many people even today we're living from paycheck to paycheck and we wanted to give something we, we wanted to help our church i mean you ever want to help your church we, we wanted to re, re, be, be able to help our church to reach that dream to, to have that 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 place of permanency but we 
didn't have the funds. My bonuses that year had been cut out. You know, let, let me tell you, if, if you re receive bonuses from your company, treat them as savings. Don't treat them as money coming in. Because when they're cut out and you're depending on them, you're in trouble. And so we prayed. And, and so what I did was I write on a piece of paper what I wanted to give, what my desire was to give. And then Janet, she wrote on her piece of paper. And, and, and then we exchanged the, the piece of paper. And guess what? We both have wrote down the very same thing. And it was an unsurpassable amount for us at that time. I'll tell you what it was. It was $2,000. But we prayed. We say, Lord, you say to ask the sower for seed. We want to do something for our church. We want to help them. So, God, would you provide the seed? Would you provide? Within a month, I got a check from the company when I was told would not get one for the company. And I was one of two people in the entire company in 60 districts that got a bonus because we had done so well. They decided they were going to give us something anyway. Wasn't they, they said it wasn't a whole lot. It was just a little bit, but you know how much it was, don't you? $2,000. Isn't God awesome? Ask the sower for the seed. Amen? He said, listen, I'm not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Let me slip down. I think I'm ahead of you. There you go. He said, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. And I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether I've been well fed or whether I'm hungry. Whether I'm living in plenty or living in want. See, here's, it, you know what he's talking about? I'm at rest. I'm at rest. I have that calm delight that God's at work in all of my circumstances no matter what. See, to be content means that you trust God's present provision to be what you need for this moment. It means even if you can't see it, God has it. Amen? And then it says in verse 13, He said, I can do everything through Him who gives me the energy, who gives me the strength, how, Paul? Because he wrote in Colossians 1.29. To this end, he said, I labor, I labor, I labor, striving with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. He's talking about that rest. What did he say? I, I'm laboring, but I'm not doing it with my energy. I'm doing it with his energy. It does not say, I strive with all my energy, which is barely keeping me together. He said, it's in his strength. The key is, it's your dream, but he'll refine it. He'll adjust it by the word. He, he'll, he'll bring it to pass, but he'll do it with his energy and not yours. And I have to hurry. I've come, I have to come to the end. We've got, we got one minute for several verses, so let me read them to you real quick. For this reason, he said, I, I kneel. Let me get it. Come on. All right, can't get it to work. He said, for this reason, though, he said, I kneel before the Father from whom, oh, no, this is Ephesians. Ephesians 3, chapter 14 through 19, verse. He said, for this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven on earth deserves his name. I pray that out of his glory and riches, he may, what? Strengthen. The Greek word here means to empower, to increase in vigor, to energize you with power through his spirit, his spirit in your inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, not your power, but his power, not your energy, but his energy, that you may know, but you may experience that energy, you may experience that power, together with all the other saints, not just as an individual, but as you work together. So let me get back to Philippians 4 real quick with the 14th verse. He, he says, and I'll read it quick. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving or receiving, except you only. He said in verse 16, turn the one over. He says, for even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I'm looking, listen to this, not that I'm looking for a gift, not that I'm looking for this money, this offering, 
He said, but I'm looking for that it may be credited to your account. Did you get that? Your account. See, it's from your account that he'll supply out all your needs. It's from how you get, you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly, you sow abundantly, you reap abundantly. And Paul is saying right here that I'm not looking that to be credit to me, but to your account. He says in verse 18, he said, For I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied. Now that I have received from Ephthalus the gifts, the offerings you sent, they are a fragrant offering, acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And then this is what he says. Because you've done this, because you've been faithful in your giving of your tithes and your offerings, being in faithful in helping me to carry the gospel around the world, he says this. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And in one translation, it said that we know in the king's language, God shall supply all your needs. Here's what we're talking it's a, it's a word picture in the Greek. It's the choir manager covering all the living expenses of the actors. And that word came to mean in the Greek to be fully supplied with nothing left out. The idea here is that God has everything you need. Nothing is left out to see your dream come to pass. He'll help bring your dreams to pass because you're fulfilling his kingdom purpose by building his kingdom. And then he said to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. All. Can you say amen? So would you stand? It's time to come alive to a new reality that God has purpose and plan for your life. He has a race for you to run. And he's buried that inside of you. And all you need to do is give him permission. Give him permission to dream with you. Some of you need to come alive to excite new potential that's already at work in your life. If God gave you the dream, if he created you with that destiny, that he has energy and power available to get you that, to accomplish it. With the vision, he'll give provision. Just let him be God. Stop struggling and begin to rest in him. Think what would happen if you would dream about that book that you, you're supposed to write, about that business you're supposed to start, about that children you're supposed to parent, about the public office you're supposed to hold, about that group you're supposed to lead, about that education you're supposed to finish. More important, what would happen if those dreams came true? What would happen if they all came true to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, everyone in public office, everyone who's in public office of any type should be furthering the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? And we need men and women like that. Forget about political parties. Think about him. Make up your mind that you feel God has called you for that and pray we need men and women who are God of men and women who vote and do things according to what the Scriptures. Thank you if God had called you to teach how you could help the children today who are in such rebellions. Just think what your dream, your vision, the lives that you touch. But please, even in business, let it all be for kingdom purposes. Amen.